Well, I would ask that you would please turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. And before I read the section of scripture that the ministry will be taken from this morning, let me ask that you would please bow with me one more time as we ask God's help upon the ministry of the word. So let's bow together in prayer. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we know that when we open up your scriptures that we are looking at deep things. And Lord, we understand that Unless we have the spirit to guide us and to teach us, we can never understand these things. So we pray, dear Father, that you would help us this morning. We pray for the spirit that he would guide us as we listen and guide us as we speak, that he would bless the ministry of the word to the hearts of your people, that we might be built up in the faith and made more like our Savior. Help us, O God, in every weakness that we have this morning. And bless us with the might of your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So John chapter 13, and I'll just read two verses for you. I'll read verses 34 and 35. And these are the words of our Lord. And he says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciple, if you have love one for another. Now, these words are spoken by our, our, our Lord in the final week of his earthly life. And some have even referred to this final week as the Passion Week. It began on a Sunday by Jesus entering Jerusalem on the colt, and the people waving the palm branches and shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And it ends on the following Sunday with the glorious resurrection of Christ. And of course, this is something that next Lord's Day we will be upon and remembering. But on that Thursday, on the Thursday evening of that week, Jesus and his disciples are celebrating the Passover. The Lord's Supper is instituted and Jesus is preparing his disciples for his death. He is preparing them by giving them the most profound lessons. These are his final words before he is put to the cross. These final words are broadly characterized as the upper room discourse. And these very verses that we have before us that was read in your hearing encompasses one of those profound lessons that Jesus teaches his disciples in that final day. Jesus here gives a new commandment. He says in verse 34, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Now, the commandment to love one another is technically not a new commandment. It had already been given to God's people in the Levitical law all the way back in the Old Testament days there on the Mount of Sinai. And this had happened over a thousand years ago. And we, we have that commandment given to us in Leviticus 19, verse 18, and it is a part, a part of this moral law that God gives. And he tells the people, you shall not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people, but, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So we can go all the way back to the Old Testament days, there at Mount Sinai, when the commandment of love is given. And certainly, a first century Jew would know this command. And of course, any religious Jew would certainly have taken this command very seriously. 
And this becomes obvious through the testimony of the Gospels themselves. So throughout Jesus' ministry, he is confronted with those who acknowledge this command and who sought to keep it. And I'll give you two examples. Remember back in Mark chapter 12, verses 28 to 34, when Jesus is confronted with this scribe, and a scribe says to him, what command, commandment is most of all? And this is the question that this scribe comes and he poses to Jesus. And you'll remember that Jesus is often being confronted by scribes and Pharisees and others asking him questions. And yet here is this one scribe seeking to test Jesus. And he says, what commandment is foremost of all? And what Jesus does is he goes on and he quotes what is known as the Shema, this Jewish prayer that even if you went to a synagogue today, the Jews will be still saying this prayer. And you're familiar with this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And this is what Jesus says to this scribe. And then Jesus goes on to tell the scribe again, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But what we notice in this text is that the scribe is not baffled by Jesus' response. In fact, the scribe agrees with Jesus, and he even states to him, Yes, you are right, teacher. So, Je so the scribe and Jesus come to this kind of agreement between the two of them, an agreement that rarely took place between the Pharisees, between the scribes, and between Jesus's, Jesus. But they found some common ground here where this scribe and Jesus can come and say, yes, the, we are in agreement. We both understand that we are to love our neighbor as ourself. And the scribe could even say to Jesus, as if he is his teacher, yes, you are right. Well, Jesus knows that he is right. So there is complete agreement between the scribe and Jesus about loving their neighbor, though they might not have agreed on very much but they certainly agreed on this. There is another example of this. Do you remember the account of the rich young ruler in Matthew 19? The question again is posed to Jesus by this rich young ruler, and he says to Jesus, what good thing shall I do to obtain eternal life? And Jesus goes on to tell him to keep all of the commandments, he is not to commit adultery. He's not to bear false witness and other things. And then he responds, the, the rich young ruler responds by this, well, which ones should I keep? And as Jesus goes on to quote this list, a list of commands, the final one that Jesus comes to is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And even as this young ruler, as these commandments are laid out before him, he could say, I have kept all of these things. Lord, I have not committed adultery. I have not bear, bear false witness against my neighbor. And I even am loving my neighbor. He's telling Jesus all of these things that he's done. He's kept these commandments, including the commandment to love his neighbor. So what we see is that in the biblical evidence, the loving of our neighbor or the loving of one another is nothing new. It is something that has been going on traditionally through the people of Israel from their most early days, from when God had spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai and given him the law. So then this brings us to a question then. Well, what is Jesus talking about when he says, a new commandment I give to you? So what is the sense in which this commandment is new? I submit to you that the commandment is new in two ways. The first is that there is a new standard given. It is new because the old command to love called for individuals to love their neighbors as themselves. 
you were to place your neighbor or your brother on equal ground with yourself. He is not beneath you, but he is certainly, certainly as you are. He, your own personhood is the standard, and you must treat others as you would treat yourself. So how do we treat ourselves? Well, we tend to be very patient with ourselves, right? We tend to be very kind with ourselves and very understanding with ourselves. And we always put the best construction on our own actions. We're never going to say to ourselves, oh, no, I, I, how often do we think that we're wrong? Most of the time we think that we're right. So this was the standard. And the command called for treatment of your neighbors the same way. So if you were going to be patient with yourself, then you are to be patient with your neighbor or your brother. If you're going to be kind and understanding with yourself, then you must be the same way with your brother or your neighbor. If you're going to put the best construction on all of your actions, then you must do the same thing with your brother or your neighbor. This is what the old commandment called for. But in the new commandment, we ourselves are no longer the standard. Christ is now the standard. So we are not to love ourselves as our neighbors, but we have to love or love our brother as ourselves. We ought to love our brother as Christ loves. So we are no longer loving our Savior as ourselves, but we are loving our neighbor as Christ. So this, the subjective nature of love is completely removed. And it doesn't matter how I treat myself, but what matters is how Christ treats me. So that's how the commandment is new. You see that, right? You, you, you see how Christ says, no, do, don't focus. Don't, you're not focusing any longer on yourself as the standard of what it means to love, because that is so subjective, right? For what's good for one person is good for another, may not be good for another. We have all these various standards of what it is to show love to one another. And what might be right for me, somebody else may say, no way, I'm not doing that. So the standard is so subjective. But now Jesus says, I am the standard. I'm the objective standard, standard that you must follow. And what you see me do, this is what you do. And that removes every person from the equation. And Christ himself becomes the standard. The commandment is expanded on. So when Jesus says here a new commandment is given, given he's not saying that this is a completely new commandment that nobody's ever heard of before. And we could see that through the examples we pointed out. None of those, the rich young ruler or the, uh, the scribe came to Jesus when he said these things and said, you know what, this is amazing. I've never heard of such a thing before. They don't say that. They understand what that old commandment was. And then Je Jesus builds on that old commandment. And he's done this before in scripture. Right. Remember when Jesus says, talks about adultery and he says, it's not just ba basically the act of adultery that's considered adultery anymore. But if you look upon a woman with your eye and lust after her in your heart, you have committed adultery. What does he do there? He expands the commandment. And he's doing the same thing here with love. He's expanding this commandment. And there is another sense in which I, I think the commandment is new here. The first, and it is this, that it is perfected in Christ. This commandment of love, love your neighbor or love your brother as I has loved you, is perfecting the commandment. So, so those, even the disciples can look at those, those Old Testament saints. They can look at Abraham and Moses and David and Elijah and all of these heroes of faith in the past. 
But even when they look at these individuals, you'll see that they are imperfect. They are not perfect. Every single one of these individuals had problems, spiritual issues in their lives that they needed to deal with. But Jesus sets himself up as the greatest example of love. He is God incarnate. He is God in the flesh. And therefore, the ultimate example and epitome of love. And he is the ultimate example of what love ought to be. It is new because now there is this perfect picture lived out before the world on what it means to love one another. And what an excellent example the world has before its eyes when it looks at Christ and it sees Christ loving. And what a perfect example the disciples had as Jesus loved them. And he says, as I have loved you, you love one another. The perfect example of love, of how they were to love one another, and ultimately how every believer and every Christian is to love one another. The world and its institutions are constantly chasing love and trying to find out what it is and figure out what it is. They are chasing it, but they never catch it. It's in all of the songs. It's in all of the TV shows. Everyone is seeking it, but they fail miserably. And the reason why they fail is because they are living by the wrong standards. They're not living by the standard of Christ. They're not seeking love by the standard of Christ. They are seeking those subjective standards. Even all of the governmental and city institutions. How there's certain things you can't say because it offends people. There are certain things you can't do because it's offensive to people. They're trying to legislate, legislate good behavior and love to your brother. And they can never do it because the standard is always changing. But when we look at Christ and we use him as our standard, we see that that never changes. Amen. It is perfect. So then secondly, the example of love that Christ leaves behind. What is this example of love? If Jesus says you love one another as I have loved you, well, how did Christ love them? What did he do? Well, let me just point out a few things to, do, to you. I'll point out some things and what I'm calling the immediate context, even the immediate context of our scriptures here, and also some things that are the broader context. But in the immediate context, we know that just a, just a few earlier on in the same chapter, where Jesus washes the disciples' feet. And this whole act is quite significant because, you see, Jesus is the leader. Jesus is the teacher. He's the rabbi. And customarily, the teacher, the leader, or the rabbi does not wash the student's feet. But the students would wash the teacher's feet. But even though G Jesus is, will soon be crucified, he is still teaching his disciples this valuable lesson. That even though I am the leader and I am the teacher, I'm going to humble myself and wash your feet for you. And as he girds himself with his towel and he pours this water into the basin and begins to wash and dry the disciples' feet, he is demonstrated a, demonstrating a pure act of humility and service. He performs an, an act that is highly unusual because here he is as the master washing the servant's feet. And then the, the disciples you see are not left in, in the dark about why Jesus does this. He tells them, do you know why I've done this to you? And he tells them that as Lord and teacher, he will wash his, their feet, and they must be willing to wash one another's feet. 
There is the master, the teacher, becoming the servant. There is humility there. In other words, I command you to humble yourselves and become one another's servants. Lower yourselves and raise up your brother or sister. Follow my example and do as I have done to you. So that's the ultimate lesson that Jesus is teaching there with his disciples. Lower yourselves. I have to lower myself and I raise up my brother and my sister by being humble and humility and through humility. Now, before you get too nervous, brethren, I am not advocating that we wash each other's feet. We don't have to do that. The lesson is humility. Be humble. View others higher than yourself. This is what Christ does. And this is what we do. But then we go further. And let's consider some of the uh, some broader context. And we have the broad context of Christ's own ministry. His overall life and ministry is a display of humility, patience, and compassion. And think of it further along. We talked a little bit about humility already, but even further on, as we consider the life of Christ, we consider his humility, understanding that Jesus Christ was seated up in heaven. He's a part of the Godhead. He is there with the Father and the Holy Spirit, and he is referred to as the Logos. So before he even takes on the nature of humanity, there he is in heaven, creating even back before things were created. He is the creator. He's there in heaven, but yet this God, this Logos, takes on human flesh and becomes an ordinary man. There is his humility. And as Jesus walked through the various streets of Jerusalem and other places through Galilee, and as, as individuals would look upon him, they would not see anything. They wouldn't see that he's God. He had a normal body just like they did. And he wasn't walking around with a halo shining over his head. He was a man. And there is his humility. By coming from heaven with his father and with his spirit and now come to earth and being made into a man. And when Jesus comes to this earth as a man, he doesn't come as a king. He doesn't come as a ruler. He comes in poverty as the son of a carpenter. There is his humility. So in the broader context, when we look at Christ's life, we see that he is a man who displayed humility amongst the people. But then there's also his patience. There is his patience. And I think one, one good evidence of, of the patience of, of Christ is, well, it, he, you understand that even when many times when he get into these discussions, with his disciples that there sometimes they just don't get it. They just don't understand. But Christ is patient with them. And one such example is found in Matthew 20 when Jesus gets finished telling his disciples for the first time that he is going to be handed over to the people in Jerusalem. And he's going to be handed over to them and he's going to die and he's going to be crucified. So he lays all of this out before his disciples. And what takes place immediately after that is that James and John and mom go to Jesus and they want to know who's going to be greatest in the kingdom. Can mom says, can one son sit on your left and one son sit on your right? Do you remember that in scripture? 
So imagine this. Jesus just informed his disciples that I'm going to be handed over and I'm going to be crucified and I'm going to die. And then here come mom with her two sons saying, hey, Jesus, uh, can one of my sons sit on your right and one sit on your left? But how does Jesus respond to them? He says to them, this is not given to me, but it is only given to my father. My father in heaven gives this. Now, who could blame Jesus if he had blew his top and said, what are you talking about? Didn't you just hear what I said of how I'm going to be killed? How I'm going to be handed over to the people and abused? And all you care about is who's going to rule in a kingdom that's not even existing in the way that you think it does? Who do you think you are? But Jesus doesn't do that. He simply tells them, it's not mine to give, but my father in heaven. There is his patience. He is patient with his disciples. And then we can look at his compassion as well. We can look at the compassion of Jesus. And we see that all over the place in scripture and his miracles. There are lame people that are constantly being healed all over the place. There are blind people being healed. There is leprosy being healed. And Jesus has compassion on all of these individuals. So Jesus is not approaching these people with this kind of ho-hum attitude. He's saying to them, or he's coming to them with great sorrow in his heart. As a, as a God who comes to his people with perfect compassion. Now we can never understand what that means to have full and perfect compassion. Because even though there are things that we care about our own, our own families and with our own children, our compassion for them can never be perfect. But Jesus comes to these people who are sick and, and lame and blind, and he brings a perfect compassion to them. And he heals them. And even as he can come before the grave of Lazarus, and he could weep in sorrow, even in that weeping, the compassion there is full and perfect and untainted with any kind of sin as our compassion is. That's Christ. That's the broader con context, of, context of who Christ is. The great example of love in Christ as he cares for all of those needy people. But then Christ, even in our text, he shortly will be showing them the greatest example of love that there is. The greatest example of love was him dying on the cross for their sins. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, dying on the cross for their sins, receiving the wrath of the Father, receiving all of that punishment, his life being taken away from him and being buried in the tomb, but yet rising again. And the apostles, the, the, the apostles haven't seen that yet, but they sure will come to understand that great compassion of Christ, not only to them, but to all of his people dying upon that cross. So then what is the end result? What is the end result? So Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another even as I have loved you. And why? And, how? and here's evidence that you know you are loving one another. How do we know that we love one another? By this, all men will know 
that you are my disciples if you keep, if you have love, excuse me, one for another. So that becomes really the ultimate test. That's the ultimate test of our salvation is if we have love one for another. It is a primary distinguishing characteristic of the Christian to love one another. In our own experience, in our lives, and in, in, in various churches teach us that it's not baptism, it's not people who will make a profession, and it's not individuals who might live a moral life, but is, it is if you show love one to another. That's the test of true conversion. And remember what Paul says in Corinthians when he says, even if I speak with tongues of angels and I have not love, I am a clanging symbol. So you could do mighty works and you could do wonderful things for God. But if we do not have love, we are nothing. Love to one another is also a ministry. When we love one another, we are ministering to one another. Most people will never stand up in the pulpit or, or go out on a street corner and preach the gospel. But nonetheless, you are preaching a sermon. You are preaching a sermon when you are showing love to one another in humility and in compassion and patience. That is your sermon. That is my sermon. And then we understand also that the, this Christ-like love, again, is not the way of the world. It's so easy for us to be infiltrated with all kinds of thoughts of the world. We are in the world, and we struggle with these things, and it can be difficult for us. And we imbibe these things, and before we even realize it, we are carrying on the way the world carries on. But we must be determined to be Christ-like in our love. Not a subjective kind of love, but even as he loved in patience and humility and in compassion. So let me close then with this. How are we doing? How are you doing as an individual with Christ's new commandment? How are you doing? How am I doing? Are we loving one another as Christ love you? Is it plain to see that you are Christ's disciple because you are showing love to your brothers and sisters? When people who don't know us maybe come into this place or see you out in the world, are they able to recognize the love that you have for your brothers and sisters? Can they see that with their own eyes, even as the disciples saw it in Christ and as others see it in Christ? Where well, these are questions that we must answer for ourselves and these are things that we must always endeavor to labor and struggle and to grow in because it can be difficult but nonetheless, Christ commands us to do it. Let's close in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we understand that in our own strength, we are not capable, O oh Lord, of following any of your commands. Even as we have before us this command to love one another, Lord, we understand that we are faulty in it. But we are thankful for the example that you've given to us, 
And we pray that you would help us to always aim high, to try to hit the mark of what you have laid out for us, to love as you love, even as you commanded us. Lord, help us in our weakness. Help us in the many ways that we fail at this task. And may we be encouraged as we seek to walk more faithfully according to your word. So bless us, Lord, we pray, and help us, we plead. In Jesus' name, amen.